Well, Jack, thank you very much indeed for reading for us. And may I add my welcome, and if this is your first Sunday with us at St. Helens, I do hope it will be the first of many, and a particularly warm welcome to you. Please keep the Bible open there at page 1220. And I want us to think this evening about membership and about maturity in what ought to be the most attractive community in the world, membership and maturity, in what ought to be the most attractive community in the world. A number of years ago, I joined a gym. Uh, I took the wise decision of joining it six months before it was built. It's a great time to join. You get a very good discount, and you don't have to take any exercise. I cancelled my membership six months after construction was completed, after three visits, and I think it probably is the most exp expensive gym membership per visit ever recorded in London. The thing that struck me, however, um, when I joined was the way it was advertised. So there were a few images of muscle-bound models, not enough to put me off, but one or two just to sort of attract. But uh, the real way they marketed it was social life. And I suppose when one pauses to consider it, that's not very surprising, given that we were made to relate. We are social beings, and we need to deal with one another. Society matters. But when one arrives in London or at university or in a new business, there are any number of people vying for our membership, for our attention, for us to belong. And today I want to talk about membership and maturity and what should be the most beautiful society on offer. And I want us to see that the genuine church is a beautiful thing, and I want us to see what it takes to belong to and to build the genuine church. And I hope you've got a real interest in it. You'll notice from our, our reading that there are um, three images uh, deployed by Peter from verse 22 through to chapter 2, verse 10. The first is of the family with talk of new birth, babies, growing up, and brothers and sisters. It's the picture of family. The second from verse 4 through to verse 8, the images of the temple, which we'll come to next week, which we find is a place of worship, what it looks like to worship. And then finally, in verses 9 and 10, we have the people of God with talk of proclamation of the gospel. So we are actually talking about the church, its membership, maturity, its worship, and its proclamation and witness. And today we're just going to have a look at membership and you're going to find, we're going to find a real surprise here. I'll come to the surprise at the end. Uh, so we're going to look at the membership and what maturity looks like. What does it mean to belong to and build the church, this beautiful society? So let's begin by examining the beautiful society. There are a pair of couplets really, verse uh, 22 and then 23 to 25, and then verse 1 and verse 2. And verse 22, we see positively the children of this family are to love one another strenuously, earnestly. And then verse 1 of chapter 2, negatively, the children of this family are to put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Let's take the positive first. Chapter 1, verse 22. Having purified your soul by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again. And that word earnestly simply means outstretched. It's an athletic word, and therefore we're thinking of an Oscar Pretorius or a Mo Farah straining for the line, or a, of a, perhaps a banker or a lawyer working for completion, or, or maybe of a student outstretched for their final exams. It is an energetic word, an active word, a word that implies real graft and proactive effort on the part of the one loving. Love one another earnestly 
in an outstretched way from a pure heart. The word sincerely simply means unhypocritical. It comes from the word which our word hypocrisy comes from. It means literally not putting on a mask or a face. In the first century, if you were an actor, you went on stage and the actors actually had masks in front of their face. That was the way you acted. You put a mask on. So love one another in an outstretched way, sincerely. And here is Peter's logic. He has explained to us the true grace of God over these last two weeks that we've been looking at, the salvation that God has won for us. It is durable, unfading, undefiled. Uh, It is uh, um, imperishable. It is secure. It is kept in heaven for us, even as we are being kept for it. It is a gift. It's given to us. It will be revealed to us at the return of Christ. It has been spoken about by God's prophets down through the ages, and now it has been declared in Christ and guaranteed to us through the imperishable blood of the Lord Jesus, the precious blood of Christ. And so, says Peter, having been ransomed from the futile ways of life handed down to you by your forefathers... Now that we are part of God's family, we have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So then, given that God has worked in us to bring us into this family with real brothers and sisters as newborn babies, let us love one another earnestly, proactively, strenuously, thoughtfully. We are to love then at full tilt. We are to love with no play acting. We are to love from a purified heart. And that theme runs right the way through this letter. Just glance across the letter at chapter 2, verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood. And now across the page at chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love. And then over the page to chapter 4, verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. And then chapter 5, verse 14, greet one another with the kiss of love. There then is the positive. And if the positive is there in verse 22, we find the flip side in chapter 2, verse 1. To put away there, so put away all malice and all deceit, to put away is literally to strip off. So the Christian family member is systematically to strip off, strip off all attitudes and actions of their previous life. And again, the logic is clear. You've been brought from your previous family that passes away, and you've been brought by God and born into his family. And so strip off all malice. This means there is to be no hint of evil at all in this family. All deceit. This means that there is to be no politics, no pretense, no manipulation, no playing one off against the other. Hypocrisy. This means there is no saying one thing to the face of the person and another thing behind their back. No play acting. Envy, this is to be no wishing I was in his shoes or her shoes, no petty jealousy about James's gift or no envy about Jane's guy, no secret desire for Jeremy's girl or Jennifer's gold. There is to be a disciplined denial, a stripping off, rid yourselves. And then finally, all slander is the barbed, barbed, backbiting comment. Oh, he's such a good guy, but. (laughs) We really like her, but. The carefully veiled knife in the hand of the smiling assassin. And I hope you will agree that this kind of society really is the most beautiful society in the world. Real brothers and sisters, loving one another earnestly in an outstretched way with passion, loving one another purely, loving one another sincerely, ridding ourselves 
of hypocrisy and envy and deceit and malice and slander. Some of us will be fortunate enough to come from families where we know what it is to be loved by parents who genuinely want the very best for us. And Peter says, in the church, we are to be like that. People who quite literally go out of the way to love from a pure heart with no ulterior motive. People who seek deliberately to strip off malice and envy and hypocrisy and deceit. I remember a teenage girl, not uh, related to me, but a teenage girl visiting a youth group and returning home to her mother. I loved it. The blokes were not predatory. I remember another teenager coming off a summer camp where they'd spent time with Christian friends over the period of a week. The friendships were so deep, really struck. My predecessor, who spent decades working here in the city and knew many, many, many men here in the city, both Christian and non-Christian, Men in the non-Christian world have very few real friendships. Here is the Christian church, says Peter. You've been born again through the living and abiding word of God. Love one another strenuously from a pure heart. Put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Did you notice the alls, all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all slander. I've been preparing this all week, and I've just been so challenged by it in every meeting and conversation I've been in, actually, how easily. You know, we were out to dinner on Thursday night with some old friends. You discuss other old friends, and how easily the hypocrisy creeps in. A meeting on Wednesday afternoon, how easy to try and get one's own way. And I do think this is a great time of year for us to be studying this. I mean, it's wonderful that we're looking at this at this time of year. What does the true grace of God, that's Peter's concern for these little churches spread across Asia Minor, that they stand firm in the true grace of God. What does the true grace of God look like? Oh, it looks like an eternal inheritance kept in heaven for you, who are being guarded by the goodness of God. There it is. Now what does it look like? In the present, membership of the most beautiful society in the world. So it's very easy, isn't it? I mean, this is the time of year when all sorts of people are trawling London looking for a church. And that's a wonderful thing, and that may well be you. And it's very easy to be looking for a church and saying, well, what am I going to get out of this? Or... What's in it for me? But there's none of that here, is there? So that Peter wouldn't imagine a Christian coming to a small group on a Sunday at six, or coming to Sunday at six, or heading off to a small group midweek and saying, what's in it for me? How can I promote me? Not what I am going to get out of it, but rather what am I going to give to it? How am I going to love these people in an outstretched way? How am I systematically going to strip off those evil, negative attitudes of my previous life? And did you notice the very interesting thing? He doesn't actually give us any application at this point. Not really. So he doesn't tell us precisely what it's going to look like, and I guess it will be different for every one of us. And what are there, about 500 of us here this evening? And Peter would imagine 500 of us thinking to ourselves, how am I going to love my Christian brothers and sisters in this little small group, in this congregation, my Christian brothers and sisters in my office, wherever it happens to be, in an outstretched way? With 500 different answers. And therefore, um, I have two homework questions. I, I know... Uh, 
you may have thought you've sort of escaped homework and all that sort of thing. Uh, and actually, this is more like a GCSE coursework project. And I know that's not very fashionable under Gove's Britain anymore. But just imagine for a moment, there's a bit of coursework this week. And uh, let's talk about it over something to eat in a few minutes' time. How am I going to love in an outstretched way? What will it look like for me? What's it going to look like for you? Of course, if you're uh, part of a small group, it's quite hard to love in an outstretched way if you don't actually turn up. That proves quite tricky, doesn't it? I, I will love with a plastic cardboard cutout of me one week in three. Doesn't sort of, I'm not sure it sort of fits really, does it? I'm going to love the members on a Sunday evening by coming, actually. And by coming with the attitude, I've come to love you and to serve you. In fact, in the days of, you know, email and texts and Facebook and any number of other multimedia ways of communicating, there are all sorts of ways we can love in an outstretched way through the week. Trouble with a church like St. Helens, it is quite big, and therefore it can be quite easy just to sort of uh, hide oneself away a little. But as far as Peter is concerned, there are no spoiled children shutting themselves away in their room in the Christian community. And therefore, perhaps if one's arrived in London saying, what a relief, I'm away from the difficult relationships in my old church and a chance just to sort of burrow myself away a little and withdraw from those kind of things. Now, if you've been born again and you're a real Christian, you're part of the family. This is the true grace of God on earth. Stand firm in it. Well, you may say, that's all very well. It is a beautiful community, isn't it? Let's have a look now at uh, why I should love other Christians like this and how ever do we learn to love like this. And I want us to move now from the beautiful society to belonging and building. And we're moving now from the lifestyle to the lifeblood of the Christian family. And if you've got a little uh, notice sheet there, we're now under the second major point and we're moving towards the first little bullet point under it. Um, and I can't for the life of me remember what it says, something about being born again, I think. Why should we love? Because we've been brought into existence through the word of God, and therefore we have membership of this community. That is, we are born into God's family by God's work through God's word, and that is why we are to love our Christian brothers and sisters. And then how should we live, chapter 2, verse 2, by growing up through the word of God? So, being born again. We are to love one another in an outstretched way because we have, we have together been born into God's family. Look at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So then these Christians, scattered throughout northern Turkey, had obeyed the Christian message by turning to Jesus and accepting the forgiveness he offers. That is the obedience of faith in the Bible. It is responding to his command to repent and believe, turning to Jesus, that is the obedience of faith. And so, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, love one another since you've been born again through the living and enduring word of God. Why love? Why love one another? Because all around you are others for whom God has worked in the same way, wiping the slate clean, bringing them into his family, bringing them alive to new birth as new family members. You are part of God's family now, Love one another. You've been born again into a whole new reality. And the image of verse 23 is one of new birth, out of a family that decays and into God's eternal family that endures. Just glance at it as again, would you please? You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So if you have heard the good news of Jesus Christ, 
and responded in obedience to him, his eternal word has brought you to new eternal life. You have been born again to belong to his family. And therefore, you are part of a whole new family, not your old family, the family of flesh that withers and fades, but a new family that lasts forever. I have at home um, a very precious tray. I mean, it's pretty shabby, to be honest, but it's precious to me. Because about 15 years ago, my, um, maybe it was much less actually, about nine years ago, my wife took a whole series of photographs when we were on our family holiday. And uh, all our family were there. And then, unbeknownst to me, at Christmas time, she papered them or pa pasted them all onto this tray. And it was one of the happiest family holidays I can remember. It was nine, ten years ago. It was absolutely glorious. So everybody I loved was there. Um, we spent a lot of time actually uh, cutting down trees. And there are several images of, you know, my dad and my mum and then uh, my siblings and my wife and my children with chainsaws and axes and all the sort of things that make a really good family holiday. <laughs> and I got it out this week. And I thought to myself, well, here is my earthly family. And, uh, you know, my father, who is probably my best mate in the world, apart from my wife, um, is now no longer able to make it to the spot where we had such fun that summer. He might contest that, so please don't tell him, <laughs> but he's now 87. And my siblings have, you know, got less of some things and more of others 15 years down the track, you know, a bit of a paunch here and not a lot of hair there. Here is my earthly family. It's a fading thing. It does not last. All flesh is like grass. I was going to bring in a, a flower from the garden, but I didn't pick it in time for it to fade, so it wouldn't have been a very good illustration, would it? But that's what <laughs> all flesh is like. You know, I did used to be really quite fit and athletic. Honest, I really did, uh, before I joined the gym. But you see, if you have responded to the eternal gospel, the salvation that we've been hearing about for the last two weeks, God has brought you alive to new birth through his living, do you see it, and abiding word which remains forever. This is the gospel, the good news that was preached to you, and therefore God has entered into your very soul and brought you alive into his family. You're a, a brand spanking new baby. You know, we had some people to supper on uh, Wednesday night or Tuesday night this week, and uh, one of them, they, you may be here, had just seen his new nephew. And, you know, I, girls, you won't understand this, well, maybe you won't, but, you know, blokes don't normally think about babies from the age of six through to the age when this first creature sort of arrives um, if, uh, if they have a child. And this, this lad, 26-year-old, was absolutely bamboozled by this baby as he'd seen. It was this little scrap and how perfect it was. And the image here is of God bringing you to new birth through his living and enduring word. So that if you have responded to the good news of Jesus in repentance and faith, you've been born again to an eternal reality. And therefore, you have a new family. So love one another in an outstretched way. I remember going up to university. I'd been told by an older Christian that the people of the Christian Union and my new church were going to become like my family and that I would learn to love them. And to my shame, I arrived at u the univer university as a very baby Christian. I looked at the other members at my first Christian meeting, and my heart sank to the bottom of my boots. There was nobody I thought who was like me. There was nobody I thought I would especially like. There was really nothing that I thought I would get out of being part of that particular group. What I should have been told was this. When you arrive at your university, the other Christians in the church, not will become like, are your family. They are your family, your brothers and sisters. 
and therefore you Christians scattered across northern Turkey under real pressure, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Here are your brothers and sisters. Love them from a pure heart, and actually this will enable you to stand firm to the end. There was a program um, a number of years ago called This Is Your Life. People remember This Is Your Life? Is that? No, there's a few people, a few of the oldies. No, there are a few people nodding. I don't think it's been on for a long time. You know, the great big red book. It used to be Eamon Andrews, who's probably long gone now. All flesh is like grass. And then it was Michael Aspel, wasn't it? Uh, and they would find some, you know, hapless celebrity and build a big thing about him and find out their whole life and all the rest of it. And then they would surprise them, you know, in some moment and this is your life or whatever it is. And then they would bring in all sorts of people. And at the end, by the end of the show, you know, all their friends and family were gathered around. This is your life. I want you to look around you. Don't, I know, don't be too English. Have a, have a look around you. <laughs> have a jolly good look. This. This. They look a pretty rum lot, don't they? <laughs> This is your family. This is your family. If you trust Jesus, you've been born again. You're going to be with these people forever. It's an eternal family. Love one another strenuously from a pure heart. Rid yourself of all malice. Create the most beautiful community in London. The boys are not predatory. There's a completely different level of relationship. Older men have real friends who love them. So there is membership, now maturity. And that is verse 2b. Did I say verse 2b? I mean verse 2 of chapter 2. So here is what it means to belong. Now, what does it mean to, to grow up? How is it that we are going to be the kind of family we're supposed to be? And the answer is there in verses 2 and 3. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. Now, we just need to do a little bit of work here, because the pure spiritual milk is literally the wordy milk. And I want you to know, I wouldn't normally do this, but the, the original word is a word logikos. It's the Greek word logos, from which we get our word logic. And so spiritual milk is not actually very helpful. It's the wordy milk. Some translations have the sincere milk of the word, and one commentator has the unadulterated milk of God's word, the logikos milk the wordy milk. And once again, the logic is tremendously simple. If it is the word of Jesus that brings us to new birth into the family, it is the word of Jesus that causes us to grow up in the family. So if you want a mature family and a truly beautiful Christian community, what do you need? Crave the wordy milk. Uh, last week, I brought a bar of gold into the pulpit. We don't normally do kind of visual aids, okay? So we're not doing it this way. If I were able to, I would have a baby with me in the pulpit. I tried to borrow one before the meeting, but I didn't think we could keep the baby quiet for long enough. You know, the baby is not like the five-year-old who reluctantly refuses to eat his greens. Uh, sorry, blokes, greens, that's vegetables. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, vegetables is not chicken. Vegetables are those green things. No. The newborn baby craves and longs for... The newborn baby, uh, this is a shock coming to some of you one day, wakes up in the middle of the night and howls for food. So how do newborn babies in the family of God become mature brothers and sisters who love each other strenuously? How do we create this community by craving the wordy milk. And once again, Peter doesn't tell us precisely how to do it. So here's our second piece of coursework before the GCSEs are over and done with forever. How are you going to crave the wordy milk, milk this week? 
Maybe in your flat share, we will, you will meet to study God's Word together. Maybe we will listen to the St. Helens app on our iPhone on the way to work, if that's right. Maybe we take some time out at the beginning of the day. It's a corporate activity, these little communities, uh, little groups of Christians. So certainly, if I'm only here every two Sundays, I need once every two Sundays, I need to start asking myself some serious questions about my diet... And if I only attend one Wednesday in every three, I need to ask myself whether I am becoming substantially undernourished. And if I never open my Bible at home... Do you know, I sat next to a 62-year-old businessman um, at lunch a couple of weeks ago. And I was sitting here. He was, well, not here, but, you know, I was sitting there. He was sitting there. And uh, the rector of uh, a church up in Oxford, who's a really good friend of mine, was sitting there. So he was really sandwiched, this poor bloke. But he asked the good question of both of us. He's one of the most lovely, mature, loving Christian men I know. And he asked this question. He said, do you think it's all right that in my personal Bible study, I use commentaries to study the book that I'm studying at the moment? And this other guy and me, we looked at each other. We sort of thought, oh, that's, well, that's kind, of, kind, of, kind of a question one likes being asked. And he sa- then he said, you know, for the last 15 years, I've read the Bible once a year, every year. And I just thought I'd like a bit of a change. What do you think? It's all right if I use a commentary? Isn't that wonderful? Crave the wordy milk. And you think to yourself, well, no wonder he's such a mature, godly man. A real brother. You see, if we don't long for God's word, we'll remain pygmy Christians. And if as a church we don't have the word of God right at our heart, we'll be a church with arrested development. And if you go to a church and you decide, oh, well, I'm going to go to a church where the word is not up front and central, you will be joining a dysfunctional family. And if as a Christian I don't crave the wordy milk, I will have learning difficulties all my life, And I will become a pain in the neck, actually, in the church. Because I'll be a Christian who was born again 30 years ago, but I'll have a Christian spiritual age of three. So crave the wordy milk. Crave it. So that you may grow up to salvation. Oh, that we are a church, even if we were only 15 of us, and not 500, who crave the word of God. Then we would grow up to maturity And we would be the most beautiful community the world has ever seen. Well, I'm over time. We have question time next week. I want to just throw you something to think about as we finish. We've talked about membership and maturity. Have you noticed what Peter doesn't mention? It's very striking what he doesn't mention. Very striking. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit here. Isn't that interesting? Do you think Peter didn't believe in the Holy Spirit? Peter, the senior apostle, most surprising, isn't it? No, it seems that the Holy Spirit uses his word to bring about growth. The word is the agency, if you like, by which the Spirit works, and therefore Peter talks about the word. So just be careful if you find a church where there's all talk about the Spirit, but Actually, the word has somehow been relegated to second or third place. It's not really talked about. Do you notice the other thing? Ask me about this next week in question time. you notice the next thing? There's no talk about baptism. It seems if I'd been born again, does Peter not believe in baptism? Oh, yes, Acts 2, you know, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. But as far as Peter's concerned, it's the word that brings you to new birth not the sacraments. It's the word that causes you to grow, not the sacraments. It's the word that's at the bare heart of the whole thing when it comes to our church thinking. It's the word, it's the word, it's the word, it's the word. And the other striking thing, membership. No mention of electoral roles. No membership, uh, sort of membership training. What, what, has he missed something out? Absolutely terrible. They can't be proper members of the church. No. If you've heard the word and you've been born again, 
you belong. Now grow up. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your living and abiding word. Thank you that as you speak, so you speak life into being. People are born again. We have a massive antenatal unit. We praise you for new life. And our Father in heaven, we praise you for growth to maturity. And we pray that we would be a church with your word right at the heart of our life together and make us people who crave your word passionately. And so make us those who love one another as grown-up brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen.